Hai Serta 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 Good afternoon sir Yeah good afternoon please good afternoon, uh, mute, your, mute your audio Good afternoon sir video. Okay okay Please mute your camera and audio also. Everyone, hello. Uh, can I start, sir? Professor Govind Raju? Yeah, just wait, wait. I think uh, people, uh, students will join at the last minute. Yeah. We will give extra one or two minutes. Fine, sir. Shashank, also there will, you know, uh, this program is laid on uh, YouTube. So, yes. no. yeah, uh, quite a number of participants uh, on YouTube as well. Very good. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Vinayak, I think you have to ask them to mute their uh, camera as well, in addition to audio. Uh... Sure, sir. Okay, let's start. Wait, 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 wait. What? Give, give extra minute. One more minute. Yes, sir. Yeah, Vinayak, I think we can start. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon all. I'm Vinayak. On behalf of CNRA Hall of Science and Education Technology Unit, I welcome you all for today's Science Outreach Program. We are having 45 minutes lecture followed by a question and answer session. We urge you to actively participate in question and answer session, which will be at the end of the presentation. You could ask your questions directly or comment your questions in the comment box. 
during this session i request all of you mute your camera and uh, microphone for you two participants i request you to mention only your college name in the chat box okay only attendees will get the certificates thank you all for your cooperation so let me begin by introducing speaker to you uh, dr shashank tripathi is a assistant professor at microbiology and cell biology department center for infectious this is research indian institute of science bangalore he obtained his msc in biotechnology uh, with a gold medal from the university of north bengal darjeeling and phd in life science virology from jawar nehru nehru university new delhi he completed postdoctoral research at icon school of medicine at mount sinai new york usa dr shashank has pursued research in frontline areas in the field of role of host factors in influenza flu viruses like uh, zika dengue and corona viruses recently he worked on changes in molecular profile of covid 19 patients as a covid 2 genome and its effect on one ifn mediated uh, immunity and many more he worked on many international institutions notable among them are visiting research scholar immunology and pathogenesis branch influenza division center for disease control and prevention at atlanta usa he worked as assistant professor microbiology De microbiology department icon school of medicine at mount sinai usa professor shashank He is a recipient of many awards and fellowships. Notable among them are Infosys Young Investigator Award, Infosys Foundation India in 2019, and Tata Trust Travel Award in 2019. Uh, Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance Intermediate Fellowships in 2018 and many more. With this, I request Professor Shashank to start his lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Vinay, for very uh, kind introduction, and thank you, Professor Goen, for the invitation. So, uh, uh, so this year the Nobel Prize went for uh, discovery of hepatitis C. Uh, one of the recipients, Professor Charlie Rice, uh, one of his interviews I was listening, he said that we are in the middle of a great virology education. So. Uh, never before in history people have been so much interested about uh, viruses and i think uh, uh, pretty much everybody knows as much as i do about corona viruses the vaccines the antivirals and diagnostics uh, which have immediate impact in our day to day life right now uh, but in this talk i'll try to uh, give an overview of some basic concepts where these viruses come from and once we are faced with the pandemic uh, uh, what is the future uh, after that where it leads to and i'll try to keep things simple so that uh, uh, students especially in their formative years uh, if i'm able to ignite some interest in them so i think my talk school will be fulfilled so we'll start uh, i've divided the talk in three parts first i'll talk about origin of viral pandemics uh, next we'll talk about fate of viral pandemics and in the end we'll uh, ponder over the question that can we really predict prepare and prevent pandemics is that even possible so for starting with origin of viral pandemics you must understand these three terms uh, outbreak epidemic and pandemic what is the difference so outbreak is something which is small uh, but an unusual organism has started causing infection suddenly in a localized area in a town may maybe even a state in a big country and once it starts spreading beyond state boundary lines or even country boundary lines uh, then it becomes an epidemic and once it has gone international and totally out of control then it's called a pandemic uh, now every pandemic starts as an outbreak and it has to go through these stages to become a pandemic uh, same has happened with the current pandemic it started as a small outbreak in Wuhan, China, and then became an epidemic, and then in a couple of months it was declared as a pandemic. 
So it's important to understand the difference. Now, as a brief history of uh, uh, pandemics, uh, this includes viral pandemics mostly, but some bacteria as well. So largest, largest pandemic in terms of human mortality caused so far in our noted history uh, is the plague, which has taken more than 200 million uh, lives over the millennia. But we don't have it anymore. It has been eradicated. Uh, in, in recent history, at least in the last 100 years, most of the pandemics which we have seen, they are caused by viruses. Uh, that starts with smallpox, then Spanish flu, and then uh, you see a check, and uh, there are many, many pandemics caused by different kinds of influenza viruses. And right now we have a first global pandemic caused by coronaviruses. So there are different kinds of viruses. And you can see, if you look at larger scale of history, uh, at least noted history, so uh, the number of pandemics, their frequency has gone up tremendously in recent history. And this has happened because of the major factor which causes uh, or which contributes the emergence of uh, these uh, outbreaks or pandemics is the human population itself. So uh, this is probably the most important factor, the human intervention in everything uh, required and unnecessary also. So you can see the world population has gone up uh, in, in uh, last couple of centuries tremendously, almost fivefold uh, or sixfold. And with that, uh, it has uh, captured habitat of wild animals. It has started uh, activities such as uh, uh, building unnatural structures or frequent travel, industrialization, uh, blood transfusion and other medical practices. All of these, they contribute to emergence of pandemics. And all of this started some 10,000 years ago when humans started uh, practicing agriculture. So instead of being hunter-gatherers, they started living in one place in close proximity in large numbers. And then they started hunting animals from surrounding and capturing their habitat. And that's when the uh, new kind of viruses started to interact more frequently with human population and uh, outbreaks and epidemics started. So this is probably the most crucial factor that for causing pandemics, uh, human themselves are responsible primarily. They are the main factor. Beyond this, almost 60% of new uh, outbreaks or epidemics, even which lead to pandemics, come from animals. And uh, the animal interaction has increased because of uh, agricultural uh, invent and subsequent uh, social uh, living. But uh, uh, because of this, when humans come in contact with the uh, wild animals, the viruses which are present in wild animals, sometimes they switch over and they are able to infect humans and then uh, it, it leads to emergence of a new infectious disease. Usually these uh, spillover events are uh, inconsequential mostly, but uh, out of say million of such events, uh, one rare event, the virus develops the ability uh, to further uh, replicate in the human host and then transmit from human to human. As soon as it develops the ability to transmit from human to human, uh, it, it is uh, capable for causing an epidemic or pandemic. And this uh, term uh, of spillover of uh, viruses from animal reservoir to human and then further transmission is called zoonosis. And it has basically two steps, introduction and establishment. So introduction, as I mentioned, there are many, many events where uh, there is spillover, but it's inconsequential, but it takes some time. And if the virus develops the ability to start replicating in human and transmit human to human, then there becomes the establishment. So these are the steps which are involved in emergence of uh, uh, new outbreaks, epidemics and pandemics. And these are the stages. So uh, there are several stages. So initially, say the virus will be uh, uh, exclusive to a particular animal species. And uh, then upon several interactions with humans, occasionally in one event, uh, the humans will get infected, but the virus will be limited to primary uh, subject which got exposed. And uh, that subject might get really sick or die off, but it will not uh, spread the disease to other, other individuals. And examples of such uh, primary uh, infections are say Nipah, uh, rabies, or even H5, 1, and H7, and 9, bird flu viruses occasionally have infected and killed humans and if the virus develops uh, ability or adapts to this host and then it can transmit from human to human 
and then it uh, develops the ability to cause an outbreak epidemic. And examples would be Ebola, Marburg, and SARS and MERS. And so subsequently, this human to human transmission, which when it continues for a long period of time, there is sustained human to human transmission. Then these viruses, they, uh, they can cause pandemic initially, and later on, they can become endemic or seasonal. Uh, or they can be present in human population constantly through presence of an intermediate vector also. So these are the examples of these four. And in longer course of evolution, uh, these viruses may adapt and become exclusive to human population only. That they will be, they started from an animal reservoir, but now they have completely changed the uh, way of uh, replication, which is exclusive to humans. And such viruses were, say, smallpox or polio or measles. Now, one important thing to understand here is that uh, often we talk about eradicating the virus by vaccination. So, you can only eradicate the viruses which are exclusive to humans. And that's why we've been able to eradicate smallpox or we have nearly eradicated polio. But if any virus has its reservoir present in any other animal species, you cannot remove it by vaccination. There's always a chance that it will come back in a different form. So vaccination may uh, give you protection, which is short term with the current strain, which is circulating. But if there is an animal reservoir present in the surrounding, there is always a chance that virus might emerge into a different shape and form and come back and infect you. And actually that is what is being seen right now with coronaviruses also that it is changing shape and form and uh, evading the immunity which is uh, already established. Now, <laughs> among viruses, uh, uh, their genetic material uh, is quite diverse. So, uh, but essentially it is either DNA or RNA. But the RNA viruses, they have a problem and they are the main culprits, at least in recent history, for causing most of the pandemics. And the reason for that is that uh, uh, RNA as a molecule is uh, uh, unstable compared to DNA. And because of that, there is a size limitation. Uh, the viruses which have RNA genome, their genome cannot be too large. So they are usually constrained by the size of the genome. And because the size of the genome is small, they cannot encode too many proteins. They just encode maybe a dozen or more proteins usually. Uh, coronavirus is an exception. It's about 30 kb RNA encodes about 27, 28 proteins. But that is the highest capacity among RNA viruses. Usually, they are limited uh, in their genome, which is unstable, and they cannot code for many proteins. So they will make maybe one or two accessory proteins and an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which will replicate their genome, which often lacks what is called the proofreading activity. Meaning, once the copy of genome is made, whatever is made, it cannot be corrected. And because of that, they often introduce a lot of mutations and acquire them very quickly. And since the genome is small, they replicate much faster also. And because of these reasons, uh, RNA viruses, uh, they are always in sort of higher flux. They are mutating rapidly. They are jumping between different host species. And they are causing most of the pandemics in recent history. Uh, they are... Uh, uh, some other viruses such as say, HIV, which is an RNA virus, but it converts the genome to DNA. Uh, it has caused like, a pandemic as well, but that's a slow burning pandemic, which has taken 30 years to span. But RNA viruses, on the other hand, mostly cause acute infections and they can uh, cause rapid pandemics because their gen genomes they mutate very quickly. So the steps which are involved initially, I showed you for their adaptation to human host and then the ability to develop uh, human to human transmission that comes from their rapid rate of mutations. Now, these mutations can happen through this error-prone replication of the genome, but there are a few more mechanisms. So this error-prone uh, replication of the genome is called drifting or random drifting and then followed by natural selection. But other than that, there can be genetic reassortment or genetic recombination also. And these two mechanisms, they might contribute major changes in viral genome. Uh, like in uh, one event of reassortment or one event of recombination, say 30% or 20% of virus genome changes uh, rapidly. So these are the processes which contribute to emergence or evolution of viruses uh, and which contribute eventually to emergence of uh, pandemics. These are some global outbreaks uh, in recent history. Uh, as you can see, uh, Marburg virus, Ebola, Nipah, SARS, H1N1 bird flu, uh, these are, most of them are outbreaks, some of them are pandemics, say 2009 H1N1, 
caused the pandemic and now we have 2019 uh, seasonal coronaviruses. All of these started as epidemic, uh, sorry, outbreaks. Some of them became epidemics and a couple of them went on to cause pandemics. But as you can see, uh, all of these have RNA genome, uh, uh, different sense, maybe positive or negative or segmented, but all of them have RNA genome and most of them are emerging from an animal reservoir. And you can see, uh, you see bats often uh, in these pictures. The bats are blamed that they are the main cause of emergence of viruses. So uh, we will we'll address that question, but let's take example of uh, influenza virus because this is notorious for causing highest number of pandemics in these industries. In the last 100 years or just more than that, uh, we have seen about five different flu pandemics which are listed here. And they have killed that many people. The worst pandemic recorded in history caused by a viral agent is 1918 flu, uh, which is called the Spanish flu pandemic. And it approximately killed about 100 million uh, individuals in the span of just two years. And many of the features of this virus are similar to the coronavirus which we have at hand now. Uh, at least its case fatality rate or its rate of spread and others. But uh, at that period of time in history, in 1918, uh, it was able to cause so much mortality. Especially in India, uh, it caused uh, uh, about 12 to 13 million deaths in span of two years. And that part is uh, barely described anywhere in our history. And that happened in the middle of our uh, struggle for freedom. Now, what happens is that all these viruses, when they cause uh, pandemics, uh, then they eventually became endemic or they became seasonal viruses. And this is a common fate which is seen for pandemic viruses. So, say 1918 virus, it caused a pandemic here. Then it continued to circulate in human population. And then it became seasonal. And as it became seasonal, it sort of came to a sort of agreement with the human host and its uh, lethality came down. And that's what happens with these kind of viruses. And then it disappeared for a while, for about a couple of decades in the middle, and then reappeared in 1970s. And it continues to circulate uh, up to 2009, when the 2009 swine flu pandemic virus came. Now that H1N1 virus replaced the previous pandemic virus, which had become seasonal. and even today, the seasonal H1N1 strains which you see in human population, they are, uh, their progenitor is the 2009 pandemic virus. Similarly, these other subtypes of influenza, say H3 or H2 or uh, uh, H3N2 viruses, at some point in history, they caused a global pandemic and then they became seasonal and they continue to circulate as an endemic or seasonal virus in human. So this is a fate which, uh, pandemic viruses usually go to. Uh, it's not always true, but at least in flu, it has been seen and we can sort of draw a parallel from there that once the pandemic slows down, uh, it will continue to circulate in the population and chances are that it might become seasonal. Now, how do influenza pandemics originate? Uh, so this is an extreme example because uh, as opposed to many other viruses, uh, influenza viruses have very, very wide host range. So they come from wild birds, but they can infect marine animals, say seals and whales, all the way to uh, bats, uh, pigs, poultry, and horses, dogs, cats, even, even humans. So they have a very wide range of uh, uh, animal reservoirs. So uh, if somebody tells you that they can make a vaccine which will eradicate influenza, from the face of the other, that's a blatant lie. It's just not possible. It's never going to happen. So influenza is one of those forever viruses. It will always be there. You can make a vaccine which can protect you from some of them which are circulating, but it's always impossible to make a vaccine which can eradicate influenza. Uh, the thing I told you about the category five viruses, which are exclusive to humans, so it is not, and it's never going to be exclusive to humans. Now, antigenic shift and drift, these two topics I uh, discussed in the beginning, how viruses mutate. Drift, I told you that viruses, they continue to acquire mutations and through which their genome might change. And shift is uh, either a combination or resortment of the genome. So in case of influenza, its genome uh, akin to say eight chromosomes, it has eight segments of RNA, all of which encode different kinds of proteins. So say an avian virus, which is coming from a bird, and a seasonal human virus, which is present in humans, if they co-infect 
uh, an intermediate species, say pigs. So these two viruses can go inside the same cell and exchange segments with each other. And when that happens, and in combination with some more antigenic drift, it can lead to emergence of a pandemic virus. So that's how uh, influenza viruses uh, develop into a pandemic strain. Uh, but if we take example of 2009 H1N1 pandemic, which was a swine flu pandemic uh, 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 before this uh, COVID pandemic we had. Uh, so that virus actually had its origin all the way back to 1918 virus. But there are multiple events of uh, reassortment between uh, swine virus, avian virus, and human viruses. There are multiple events of uh, drifting. All of it started back in 1918, which eventually led to emergence of novel H1N1 virus. Now, all this has been mapped well after 10 years of the pandemic. It took a lot of time and studies to figure this out, that this was a path of emergence. But what I want to emphasize from this figure is that you cannot really predict where the pandemic is going to come from. If it takes 100 years to emerge through 20 different events, so it's almost impossible to model which particular strain is going to cause the next pandemic. But uh, you can always predict a few things, which we'll discuss at the end. Now, HIV, it's uh, another pandemic, but it's a different kind of pandemic. Influenza or say coronavirus is ban pandemic, which we have at hand, they emerge within, within a year or a few months, they spread across the globe. HIV, on the other hand, uh, started in late, uh, early 1980s and it continues to be present in more than 35 million people around the globe right now. So this is also a pandemic, but it's a slow burning pandemic. And uh, as opposed to influenza, HIV primarily come from uh, these monkeys or non-human primates. And the two kind of HIVs, which are in human HIV 1 and 2, they have also emerged through multiple crossover events between, say, manga bay monkeys and then chimpanzees. Uh, so there have been long sequence of multiple crossovers which have led to the emergence of these viruses. So as of now, not really now, back in 2018, uh, there were about 38 million people actively infected with HIV. Uh, for comparison, uh, this is three times or more than three times uh, the active cases of COVID-19 right now. So it's a much larger pandemic and uh, uh, there is still no vaccine after close to four decades of research. But there are very, very effective antivirals now. So HIV is no more a death sentence. So if you have HIV, you can be put on to antiretroviral therapy and you can have a long uh, life. Now coming to coronaviruses. So coronaviruses, uh, uh, this is not the first time uh, humans uh, have been exposed to them. There are some seasonal coronaviruses, say OP43 or 229E and NL64. These are seasonal coronaviruses uh, which have been causing common cold-like infection in humans for a very long time. We actually don't know when they, actually the spillover event happened when these seasonal viruses came into humans. But uh, most notable in last 10-15 uh, years or 20 years is uh, this 2003 SARS-CoV, the first coronavirus outbreak or epidemic and followed by MERS uh, coronavirus outbreak. So the SARS-CoV virus, uh, this emerged in 2003 and it started in February and it peaked around March and then by the end of June it disappeared. The reason why it disappeared we'll discuss briefly and other is the MERS virus. Uh, all of them, many of them are supposed to emerge from bats through an intermediate uh, host species. For example, for SARS, it was a civet cat, for MERS, it's the uh, camels. Uh, but out of these, the maximum mortality has been seen in case of MERS virus, about 40% mortality. SARS virus had about 10% mortality. For comparison, the current coronavirus has mortality ranging upon geographical region, uh, anywhere from 1% to 2.53%. Yeah, so this question, uh, why so many bats here? Why these viruses are emerging from bats? So is there a problem with bats? So there's no problem with bats as such. It's just that these are the oldest mammals. They have seen many more viruses. So also about 20% 20, 20 of species in uh, mammalian uh, uh, order so is bats and about 1400 species are there and they are social animals so they live in uh, uh, clusters in trees like you see here uh, 
and uh, they are among all of us uh, in your local surroundings we are surrounded by bad habitat so or we have invaded their habitat uh, other ways you can see but uh, there was a study which showed that uh, if you look at the number of uh, potential zoonotic uh, agents or already zoonotic spillover events which have happened uh, and you count them so bats are here they do contribute uh, quite a bit but the highest number of uh, zoonotic spillover viruses are coming from rodents or primates so this uh, assumption that bats are the primary contributors of these viruses is not true it's just that uh, especially for coronaviruses uh, sars mers and the current coronavirus as well as seasonal coronaviruses they emerge from bats so there's a misconception that bats are contributing to all the viruses which is not true although they have uh, a few features uh, which they have developed over course of evolution which allow them to live in sort of a equilibrium with the uh, many viruses so they have dampened immunity they do not produce too much what is called interferons or uh, their uh, uh, immune signaling pathways which lead to inflammation are dampened uh, so because of that uh, they do not uh, elicit too much of a disease symptom upon virus infection and viruses can be present in them uh, at certain titers uh, which is not detrimental to the host and because of that uh, you see that they are often uh, uh, causing the spillover events but remember there are so many different kind of bats there is not one bat which is carrying all the viruses so there is a large diversity and there are only few species of the bats which are uh, in close contact with humans and they are carrying one particular family of viruses say coronaviruses and because we have seen them recently quite a few so we assume that bats are the major contributors okay let's discuss now in detail the uh, sars cov2 and its origin so sars cov2 um, many of you or i think most of you know now that uh, comes from this corona viridae family it looks like this it has a positive strand single stranded rna genome uh, i already told it's the largest uh, genome among uh, rna viruses and makes some 27 30 something like that proteins and there are other seasonal coronaviruses which are shown uh, here which have been causing about 30% of all cold like infections this is important uh, because uh, these infections give you some cross protective immunity and uh, that will be important in the end of the talk and there are other coronaviruses sars cov1 and mers which we discussed earlier now this started again as an outbreak in hunan uh, seafood market that's what has been claimed uh and then uh, the outbreak spread to beijing then out of china to european countries then usa and then all over the globe but uh, the claim that it started in hunan seafood market uh, it doesn't really hold very well because the first case which was reported that individual did not have any exposure or he did not even visit the hunan seafood market uh, so where did he get the virus from it's not clear and also retrospective studies for presence of antibodies uh, in samples uh, which were collected prior to the start of pandemic in china they show presence of antibodies against these viruses so it's likely that the virus was uh, there circulating in those areas in china uh, much before say december 2019 and it was undergoing those changes which allowed it to replicate more efficiently in human and then eventually acquired the ability to transmit from human to human very successfully and that's when the outbreak uh, spread out when who led the uh, investigation is on on these matters so hopefully we'll come to know what exactly happened now based on sequence data one can speculate where these viruses came from so this phylogenetic tree shows uh, at the proximity of uh, sars cov2 with other coronaviruses both human as well as other uh, animals so it's closest to the sars cov the 2003 virus and from mers or other seasonal coronaviruses it is little bit distant but when you look closely in more detail uh, uh, phylogenetic tree so the closest virus to sars cov2 is a virus called bat r rat, rat g30 and Uh, this is a uh, bat origin virus, and second closest is a pangolin origin virus. A bat uh, virus, which is mentioned here, which is closest to the current coronavirus, it was isolated back in uh, 2013, I think, 
and it was being studied in the lab in uh, Wuhan, China. Uh, and uh, this pangolin virus has been uh, discovered or described uh, last year. And so it is believed that uh, uh, there has been an spillover event in either sequence that from pangolins to bats and then to humans or there has been some intermixing between these two and which has led to the development of features which allowed the human to human transmission ability in SARS-CoV-2. Now, uh, this uh, this is further getting into possible origin of this virus. So here we see a linear structure of a spike protein, the main structural protein which allows the virus to bind to a host cell. So it has two important features. One is receptor binding domain. So this domain folds and it binds to the ACE2 receptor on human cells and allows virus infection. And then another feature is called polybasic cleavage site. This allows efficient cleavage and proper folding of the spike protein which which can make the virus ready for subsequent round of infection now this uh, receptor binding domain if you look at it closely uh, SARS-CoV-2 has receptor binding domain which is very similar to say bat RPG-13 or pangolin viruses but it is very different from human SARS viruses or other closely related bat viruses so it sort of obviates the possibility that it has been engineered because uh, if somebody has to really do that, he would try to adapt it based on SARS-CoV. Uh, but if you look at the other feature, which is polybasic cleavage site, which makes the viruses more infectious, uh, this feature is basically multiple uh, arginine residues. And this has appeared suddenly out of nowhere. It is not found in any other bat or human coronaviruses. And this has appeared suddenly in SARS-CoV-2. So origin of uh, this polybasic cleavage site is still being investigated. It's not clear. It is possible that it has come through a recombination event, but for that recombination also another wild type or uh, related coronavirus has to be there, which has this site. Uh, other ways it can develop is that if you continue to take a wild type virus and passage in human cells for a long time, it might develop this ability. <clears throat> so there are three possibilities that there was natural selection in animal hosts before the zoonotic transfer happened or there were natural selection in humans following zoonotic transfer, there is more possibility of this because there is evidence that virus or similar viruses were circulating in China before 2019. Or there is a remote chance that there might be some uh, assaging of the virus in experimental condition which allowed it to acquire these features. But all of this is speculation at this moment. Now fate of viral pandemics. So, uh, we can only speculate about fate of our pandemics and learning from previous pandemics and as the history is there, so most of previous pandemics have been caused by influenza. So whatever we observe in influenza, it may or may not translate exactly to coronaviruses, but there are many similarities between those two viruses. Both are RNA viruses, both are coming from animal reservoir, both are causing respiratory disease and spread through air droplets but uh, also the cause of death is uh, what is called cytokine storm or immune imbalance uh, response uh, but similarities end there then there are a lot of differences also in mode of replication and the nature of genome so if you want to understand fate of viral pandemics so there are a few terms one has to understand uh, one is what is called the r naught or basic reproduction number so uh, this basically uh, uh, tells about the infectious nature of the virus that from one individual how many more individuals can be infected under sort of a hypothetical control condition that is the entire population is susceptible there is no cross reactivity there is no antiviral intervention there is no antiviral drug or vaccine being given if that hypothetical scenario stands then uh, uh, one influenza virus infected individual can infect maybe two more uh, or like that for SARS-CoV-2 initially there were a lot of variation but I think now it has come down that it's R0 is about 2.5 or up to 3. But as I mentioned this is an artificial construct and this is basically used to estimate uh, how many people in a particular population need to be vaccinated in order to develop what is called herd immunity, we discussed that. 
so uh, as i mentioned the r not is a measure of uh, infectious nature it doesn't necessarily represent the uh, virulence or pathogenicity of the virus it just tells you how fast it can spread and this is the same thing and uh, it shows that uh, it's not necessary that virulence and uh, uh, mortality rate and uh, r not will correlate with each other uh, they can be very different now <laughs> So question arises that uh, the SARS-CoV virus, the 2003 virus, uh, if you see, it has a uh, mortality rate of about 10%, and it also has, uh, say, uh, R0 of about uh, 4 or 3.5. So uh, one would naturally think why this one did not cause a pandemic. So the reason lies here. So a virus which is uh, highly virulent or causes very severe disease, it's actually not a good candidate for causing a pandemic. So what was happening is that in 2003 uh, SARS virus, the virus shedding starts when people have very, very clear symptoms. Uh, they are already gasping for breath and they're very sick. And that's when they start shedding the virus. And those kind of people, you can easily identify them and quarantine them or isolate them. And that limits the spread of the virus. Whereas the main feature of the current COVID virus is that the virus shedding starts even before you show any proper symptoms. And because of that, these people, they continue to spread the virus without developing any disease. And especially in case of children, uh, uh, this is a benevolent virus, it has spared the children, but children do not show any symptoms and they continue to spread the virus for a long period of time. And because of these features or this particular feature, this virus has spread so fast and uh, successfully caused a pandemic. So, virus does not need to be highly lethal. Actually, that's counterproductive. It needs to, it needs to spread faster and cause pandemic. Yeah, so about herd immunity. So it's, uh, as I mentioned, R0 uh, is basically used to calculate what percentage of the population required to be uh, immunized in order to develop herd immunity. <clears throat> but again, herd immunity also is an artificial construct like that. Uh, naturally, herd immunity, how it will develop, there will be many, many factors. Uh, and it's not just dependent on, say, antibody mediated immunity. It could be cell mediated immunity, uh, it could be antiviral interventions, it could be public health measures. All of that can contribute towards limiting the spread of the virus. But formula wise, uh, this is what is the formula. So, if, uh, say, <clears throat> if R0 for a virus is about uh, 3 for SARS CoV 2, then you need to immunize just above 60% or close to 70% people in order to achieve herd immunity, which is which basically means that if enough number of people are immunized, the virus will continue to, uh, will cease to spread anymore. Now, what is the COVID-19's current situation? So, uh, right now about, uh, I think uh, more than 11 million or close to 11 million people have been uh, infected, more than 2 million uh, deaths have happened uh, in the last one year. <clears throat> which is actually approximately four times what is caused by uh, seasonal influenza. So it is definitely not influenza. It is uh, at least four times more lethal. And uh, if you look at the daily new cases and daily deaths uh, since the pandemic started globally, you can see that uh, we are still uh, riding pretty high, although it seems like it's coming down, but daily new cases are still very high, about 500,000 cases. and even today, more than 10,000 people are dying globally because of this virus. But in India, something uh, interesting is happening and everybody's wondering how. So although uh, we have crossed uh, uh, more than a crore infections, uh, but the mortality rate has been pretty low compared to other parts of the globe, just about 1%. Uh, and uh, the virus uh, it peaked the number of daily cases and deaths, it peaked around September and after that the festival season was to follow and it was predicted that there will be a much more severe second wave and number of infections will go up but that has not happened, uh, the virus has waned and the uh, daily number of deaths have come down drastically. So uh, there are things one can speculate why this has happened. And now, uh, I, I think uh, just uh, today or a few days ago, this uh, data on <coughs> uh, zero surveillance came from uh, ICMR. 
So back in April when they did first serum surveillance, so 0.7 percent population had antibodies. That means 0.7 percent population was exposed to this virus. In August, it went up to 7.1 percent. And this data on serum surveillance is from December month, and it shows that about 20 percent or just high higher than that people have been already exposed to this virus. Uh, by this estimate, this is February now, one can estimate that approximately 30% uh, or more or one out of every three or four individuals have been exposed to this virus. Now, uh, this should be sufficient uh, to move towards a herd immunity-like status. So herd immunity gives you percentage to seize the virus completely. But when you start to approach herd immunity threshold, the virus slows down also. So it's not like it comes to a rapid halt. In natural scenario, there are many other factors which are contributing. So instead of 63%, even when you are close to 30%, because of cell mediated immunity, because of public health interventions, because of better health care also, the death rates can come down and infection rates can come down also. So maybe we are already exposed enough that the virus is coming down. But does it mean that uh, we are safe for future? Uh, we'll discuss that. So. As I mentioned, uh, apart from being a high rate of exposure, there is cross protection from seasonal human coronaviruses that might be contributing. There are studies indicating that. Uh, we are vaccinated for BCG. Uh, in addition, we are frequently infected with a lot of bacterial and viral pathogens uh, because of, uh, of the living conditions. And that can lead to something which is called trained immunity or uh, a basal level of innate immunity which is higher than usual and that can actually dampen the effect of uh, virus infection or the severity of infection. Other factors which may have contributed to this decline is we are a very young country about 60% uh, people are under age 35 and then the areas which uh, are hot and humid and at least theoretically that should make the virus uh, less infectious. Uh, although this virus has sustained all kinds of temperatures and continue to spread. But if you take into account all of it, this explains why these cases have gone down. But if you take example of other countries which are struggling with this virus, say USA, UK and Brazil, uh, in all these places you can see two or multiple peaks. And this is what usually is seen in case of say influenza pandemics also, we'll show you the example. And US has just started coming down from its worst phase uh, uh, in January throughout this pandemic, the same for UK. And Brazil also thought that it had uh, gone beyond the pandemic, but the second wave has come down and hit them really hard. <clears throat> we can take example of this town or the area in Brazil called Manaus. So this was taken as an example because uh, uh, because of the political reasons, uh, the social distancing lockdown, all these measures were not followed very strictly. So in this area, the virus was uh, let loose to run amok. Uh, and uh, by June in this area, about 76% people were already infected. <clears throat> and this also led to a high number of casualty and very high mortality rate in this area. But people believe that since everybody is infected and there is herd immunity and cases have been down, I think uh, everybody thought that the virus is gone and this can be an example for everybody else. But see what has happened eight months down the line. The virus has suddenly surged and the sudden surge has become uh, so much so that the number of deaths are higher than in the first wave. And the reason for the sudden surge, we can speculate there is emergence of a new strain which has mutations which allow the virus to escape the immunity which was generated here. Also, the immunity which is generated by first infection, uh, many studies have been done so far, they show that it lasts approximately six months. And then there are scientific misfires. So the people already claimed in published literature that the oh, virus has gone away from this town and they, they are protected so everybody else should be. And then permanent failures and public indifference. So all of these have contributed to the emergence uh, of this virus which is uh, running wild right now in Manaus. So we can take a cue from here that Right now, India looks like this, but uh, we should not let our guard down. It can, it can happen that several months down the line, the virus has drifted, uh, it has escaped the immunity which we have developed, and then it, it may develop into a new strain as it has happened in uh, UK, Brazil, and in South Africa also, 
and it can cause a second wave which could be much uh, so only chance or only a ray of hope that we get this window and if you are able to successfully immunize our people with the vaccine then maybe even if there is a second wave we will be able to mitigate its severity and then sooner or later uh, it will become endemic and uh, we will stop having severe episodes of uh, covid disease and everybody will get uh, common cold like disease so that's where it's headed and similar trend was seen in 1918 spanish flu also so this also had sort of two and a half peaks so there was first peak then second and third peak second peak was much more severe and it was caused by a strain of the virus which had mutated from the first strain and later on it mutated again and it caused another outbreak and then followed by that it became endemic and seasonal and it continued to be present in the population in the 1940s or 1960s sorry so it uh, it, uh, it attacked population in waves and uh, as mentioned earlier also that all these pandemic viruses they introduce a different point but after that they became uh, seasonal and they continue to uh, circulate in the uh, human for a long time but this has happened in case of influenza uh, it may or may not happen in case of covid-19 uh, but, but there are chances that at least for few seasons we will continue to see the virus uh, uh, different intermediate uh, or intervals when the immunity wanes and uh, then it might happen that we might start getting the infections but if enough cross protective immunity develops that may not happen so we cannot uh, say certainly but there are chances that for few seasons we can see the virus so last point can we really predict prepare and prevent pandemics so as shown by the uh, history of emergence of 2009 swine flu pandemic it took almost 100 uh, years and multiple crossover events and uh, antigenic shift and drift which led to emergence of that virus so you cannot uh, predict that what one can do is one can look around in the environment and see what all viruses are there in humans and also in the animals which are in close proximity so for example influenza if you take so we are very closely interacting with say pigs and poultry horses Uh, cats and dogs and bats so if we uh, very thoroughly explore all the flu viruses which are present in here uh, then we can predict that the virus which might emerge and cause next flu pandemic would be something very similar or within this set of viruses and for flu actually it is very apparent we are frequently having bird flu outbreaks with h7n9 and h5n1 and those have been infecting humans and causing uh, dead end infection but with very high mortality rate so all they need to do is develop ability of human to human transmission if that happens we'll have a pandemic at hand which is uh, much more lethal uh, which may play out well in terms of controlling the disease but it may play out very badly uh, for the specific area where the outbreak might happen so this is just an example of flu but one initiative for example say global virome project uh, has been proposed where uh, objective is to uh, sample and sequence every virus which is present out there in in, in our environment and overall the estimate uh, of uh, cost of this project is 5 to 7 billion dollars uh, which is a fraction of one single vaccine project so this is worth uh, doing uh, worth uh, chasing this uh, target so that we know actually what is around if you know what is around then you can sort of a shortlist based on some logical reasoning that these could be potential uh, pandemic candidates they are present in the animals with whom we are closely interacting they are present in the forests where human habitat and animal habitat is in conflict based on those features we can predict but you cannot be very very certain and sure that this strain of this virus is going to cause a pandemic so what you can do for preparedness uh, you can develop broad spectrum antivirals so all viruses are uh, host dependent they require host cell machinery uh, many viruses they share uh, enzymes which are similar in nature say rna dependent rna polymerase so one can develop uh, antivirals uh, which can block if not all at least a handful of important viruses so one can chase broad spectrum antivirals and one can develop protective vaccines which are plug and play platforms such as rna vaccine uh, or a universal influenza vaccine or viral vector based vaccine all of which has been actually realized in case of covid-19 and we have so many vaccine candidates uh, 
in several clinical trials, many of them are proof. We must always remember that uh, this was an easy virus for developing a vaccine. Uh, it didn't mutate so much. Uh, the immunity which is generated lasts for about six to eight months. And uh, we don't know subsequent seasons what will be the rate of protection, uh, but it was not hard at all. And the single antigen just spike. If you immunize against that, you develop protective immunity. That luxury is not available for influenza or many other RNA viruses. They mutate too rapidly to escape immunity. Uh, the immune response generated is very uh, complicated. And say in case of flu viruses, if you immunize with these antigens, instead of uh, protection, you might get even severe disease. So this was an easy virus to develop vaccine, uh, not to take away the credit with which uh, everybody has come together and developed candidates. But uh, we should keep in mind that future challenges could be much more complicated. And we may not, may not be able to develop vaccines that rapidly. In the end, I will quote this uh, statement by Charles Sarin that variability is not actually caused by man. Uh, he only unintentionally exposes organic beings to new conditions of life and the nature acts on the organization and cause it to vary. And that's what leads to uh, emergence of outbreaks, uh, epidemics and pandemics. Uh, last slide, I'll show you this cartoon where the bunch of goats are looking at a wolf and denying its existence. Uh, some of just uh, saying that there is no wolf at all. Some say we rely on herd immunity. Some say that uh, a healthy and well-trained body can survive a wolf bite. And some say that only sick and old get attacked by wolves. So we should not be one of these uh, uh, sheep and then uh, we should be uh, very vigilant and aware and we should acknowledge uh, the presence of the wolf and develop means to uh, prevent its attack on us. Well, thank you and I'll end here and take questions. Yeah, yeah. thank you sir. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Now we now have we questions have... after the session. I request you to ask your questions directly by unmuting or comment your questions in the comment box. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, yeah. Professor Shashank, uh, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful uh, talk. Uh, and also, it was uh, indeed a detailed uh, you know, information uh, for our audience. For the sake of our uh, audience, I just wanted to ask one question uh, on behalf of all of them. Uh, it is not a question, rather, I request you to comment on the current uh, on, you know, the, the vaccines. Uh, which are in the marketing in, in the market and then also which are all being developed and uh, whether to take or not to take <laughs> okay so more of a you know kind of a um, awareness sure yeah so uh, you should definitely take uh, because i said we are fortunate to have this window after the first week has waned and we never know the virus might come back in a more severe form so we must use this window very, very judiciously and try to get uh, as many people vaccinated as possible. Then only there is a chance to mitigate if there is a potential second wave. Uh, even if there is not, we should definitely get vaccinated because as I said, even if you are immune now, you may, take, may not, may not uh, or is not going to last forever. For this particular virus, we already know it will last about half a year and then you will be vulnerable again. So the current vaccines which are available in India, both are very good. Uh, both have uh, more than 90% efficacy, uh, uh, at least uh, for uh, uh, the uh, adenoviral vector vaccine. Uh, for co-vaccine, it's a time-tested platform. We have been, or uh, globally, this platform has been used for a very long time. Uh, inactivated vaccines, they are always uh, uh, advantageous in terms that they don't just depend on one spike antigen or one main developed protein. They have other viral components in them also, which develop uh, a wide range of antibodies. And antibodies don't protect you against viruses just by preventing virus entry. Uh, there is complement action, there is uh, antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity. Uh, so there are multiple ways by which antibodies can you know, uh, mitigate virus infection. So. Uh, that's a good platform and both antibodies, uh, both uh, vaccines which are available in India, I think uh, people should definitely take them without uh, being hesitant about anything because there is enough people who have already taken and we see that there is no side effect as such. Uh, for everybody's knowledge, uh, the RNA vaccine which came first, 
uh, it, it is pretty painful. It's very painful vaccine, although it works very well. It's very hard to store, uh, requires uh, ultra low freezing temperatures and it's second booster when it's given. Uh, people, uh, they don't, they take a couple of days off uh, from their work because it's that painful. So compared to those, what we have at hand are uh, pretty good vaccine. We should take them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Vinayak, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, there are some uh, questions uh, from the YouTube. And uh, Bina Rani is asking a question. And is coronavirus uh, uh, can replicate within the cell or what? Yeah, all viruses, they need a cell to replicate. They cannot replicate on their own. Yeah. Uh, Professor Shishang, also on the uh, the comment box, I think there are some questions. Questions. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and the chat box. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. Want me to take them? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, maybe with okay. some of them. Uh, yeah. Few of them. So okay, is vaccine efficient? Yes, most of them are. As I said, this is an easy virus to tackle with the vaccine compared to many other very difficult viruses. So I give you an example of HIV, 40 years on, we don't have a vaccine. Uh, and what type of COVID-19 vaccine is most likely to work? Uh, again, same answer. Uh, most likely all the vaccine platforms are going to work well against this virus because this is an easy target. And there are more types of new viruses. Yeah, that's inevitable. That's what happens. Uh, it has been seen in history in other pandemics also. Uh, viruses, when they come into human population, they take some time to find the equilibrium uh, to avoid killing the host and uh, spread the sort of peacefully. And that requires uh, several permutation combination of genetic variations. Some of them can be more severe, some of them can be less. So it takes time. And why there are two vaccines in India, Covishield and Covaxin? Well, it's good that we have two vaccines. Both are good. Covishield is based on uh, replicating adenovirus backbone. So uh, it sort of acts as if the cells are getting infected with uh, uh, coronavirus, only that there's no disease and you get uh, proper immune response. Covaxin, on the other hand, is uh, based on time tested uh, inactivation uh, platform, uh, which should elicit ant antibodies against uh, many structural viral proteins, not just spike, which is useful. Uh, how can we predict that some animals around us are affected by some virus? Well, that's what I said. We need to sample our global virome around us. We need to, look, need to look into all the viruses. And now the genomics technologies have advanced. They can do metagenomic sequences, uh, which can give you basic idea that what all family of viruses are present. And if you want to dig deeper, you can dig deeper and do more specific sequences to identify specific strains. But uh, sampling and understanding what all viruses we are surrounded by, it's very important. Why some people are asymptomatic? So this is an important question and uh, one everybody should understand because this is important for protecting yourself also. So other than your uh, underlying immunity or your disease status, that will contribute whether or not you will develop a symptomatic disease. Most important factor which determines whether you will get a symptomatic disease or not is the extent of exposure. If you are exposed to a large quantity of virus, you will develop a symptomatic disease. And if you are exposed to a minute quantity or a moderate quantity of virus, you will develop mild disease. And this is what is routinely seen when people do annual challenge studies. Uh, so that's why you should avoid risky behavior and not go to crowded places without mask. Because there are chances that you'll get exposed to large quantity of viruses. So even if you get exposed to minute quantity of virus, you might develop antibody and immune response without being really, really very sick. So some people are asymptomatic, mostly because they got lower exposure of the virus amount. But other than that, there are genetic or underlying disease factors which can contribute to more severe symptoms. Um, how can a virus mutate? Well, I explained this to you that uh, their replication is error prone, their genome is small, they cannot make too many enzymes which can correct their replication behavior. That's why they continue to acquire mutations. Other than that, they can re recombine, they can reassort and change their genomes very rapidly. Why do vaccines cause side effect? Uh, 
a vaccine cause side effect depending on what pathogen is being targeted. So every pathogen has a very different kind of biology, mode of replication and pathogenesis. And the side effects you will see, it will depend on the virus. For example, in case of dengue, if you vaccinate against its envelope protein, it might enhance the disease. Uh, and that phenomena happens through antibody-mediated enhancement. Uh, that has been not seen, fortunately, in case of coronavirus vaccines. So that's why also it's an easy target. We did not see any vaccine-mediated or vaccine-enhanced disease. Uh, but similarly, say, uh, inactivated vaccine platform when used for RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, they cause very severe disease. So there are chances where you're trying to protect, but instead you lead to severe disease and that depends on a particular pathogen which is being targeted. Other than that, the vaccine component itself, what kind of adjuvants are being used? In the early days of vaccine technology, they used to cause some side effects, but now that field has advanced so much. Uh, those kind of side effects are not there anymore. Are they safe? Uh, definitely, they are. Uh, what is yeah. the last solution for COVID-19? Uh, well, you have to, last solution is you have to wait it out for it to calm down. It has just come into human population. It is pretty uh, restless right now. In due course of time, it will find its uh, equilibrium. Okay. Yeah, yeah. One, one question from the YouTube, uh, Rachana. And why did he want to go back? Vinaya, there is a echo yeah. coming uh, from the hall. Yeah, one second. Hello? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Now, I think uh, uh, there must be a problem, sir, uh, that end. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, I don't uh, read, uh, read uh, out the question. Yeah, Rashna is asking, okay, why did it take months for vaccine production? Uh, because already we have know the the family of coronavirus came in the previous uh, different viruses like that mm -hmm. uh, the question is like this sir so uh, at least in this case uh, the first vaccine from the first report of virus genome obviously you need to know the virus genome sequence in order to make the protein so the first report of virus genome and the first vaccine candidate the rna based vaccine candidate which went into phase one clinical trial it went into clinical trial in two months, uh, which is unbelievable. So this is the shortest period I've ever observed. It just does not happen. So vaccine candidate development itself, which happens in laboratories, can take years or decades. And once you have something which works uh, in, say, animal models, which are called preclinical models, then you take to clinical trial. And those are done very meticulously, slowly. So first, you will test it uh, in small number of humans that it is safe. Then you will test in slightly larger population that it is eliciting immune response. And then you go to a phase three trial where you do vaccine and placebo challenge in thousands of people. And then you try to see whether the vaccination has prevented uh, the incidence or not. Now for developing vaccine, the question you asked that we already had uh, previous coronavirus incidences. We could not develop vaccines against say MERS or SARS because the virus has disappeared from the population. If you want to do a phase three trial and estimate the efficacy that the vaccine is causing uh, mitigation of virus spread, the disease has to be prevalent in the population. If the disease has disappeared from the population, you cannot do phase three trial. And that's why there were many candidates which were in phase one trial for uh, say SARS-CoV or MERS or for say Zika virus also but they could never be tried in phase three trials because the disease disappeared on its own. So because of that reason, some viruses are difficult to tackle because they come and go, come and go. So Zika virus, it appeared in 2005, then disappeared, then came in 2007, disappeared, and came back in 2015 and disappeared. And now it might come back again. So you will always be chasing the virus. So there are many complications. As I mentioned, uh, this was probably the easiest target to develop a vaccine. Uh, but it was a good practice target and we have developed the technologies which we need. What else? Can rodents cause something bigger than coronavirus? Rodents, well, rodents caused the bubonic plague that was uh, 
at least 200 times <laughs> bigger than coronaviruses. So yeah. Yeah, and uh, one question from Krishna: Is there a possibility of uh, SARS-CoV-3? If so, what can it happen? Yeah, there is uh, quite a bit of possibility. So, as shown that in last century, we had at least five uh, influenza virus pandemic, different strains of influenza viruses. It looks like that coronaviruses are going to be the next family of viruses from where pandemics will emerge. Uh, Frequently, if not pandemic, at least we we'll definitely see more outbreaks uh, and epidemics because we are trained now how to handle these. Uh, we should be more vigilant and we should be able to stop the spread of the virus at the outbreak level. But uh, I'm pretty sure in our lifetime, we'll definitely see more outbreaks. Pandemic, I cannot say certainly because we are uh, more aware how to deal these kind of viruses now. Okay, uh, let's uh, stop now, sir. It's uh, time up. Okay, and now uh, uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, with uh, the wonderful interaction with the students and the teachers. Uh, now it's time for a vote of thanks. Uh, on behalf of CNRO Hall of Science and uh, Education Technology Unit, we express our thanks to Professor Shashank Tripathi for giving such in lecture, interesting lecture. We thank the Professor CNR Rao, FRS, and Dr. Mrs. Indamati Rao for their vision and continued guidance and commitment to the popularization of science in India. We thank the President of JNCSR, Professor G. U. Kulkarni, for extending his support and facilities for this program. We thank Mr. Dwarkanath and Narayan Rao for coordinating with the schools. And we thank the principals students and teachers from various colleges who are particip participating in today's program. So finally, we thank our technical staff and supporting staff and administration of JNCSR for, for providing the infrastructure, facilities and administrative support for this program. And thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shishan, for uh, this wonderful talk. Hope we will have you uh, in campus uh, sometime <laughs> once the sure. pandemic subside. Yeah, or once we have been vaccinated at least. Right. <laughs> That's correct. That's right. correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Thank you very much. Good day. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vinay. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, dear students, and uh, there is an announcement. Uh, I have given the feedback uh, link in the YouTube description. Please make uh, use of it. And I am sending the uh, Google Meet link, uh, the uh, feedback form to your WhatsApp group also. And please uh, use it for uh, your certificate. Please check the YouTube description I have given over there. Yeah. <laughs>